<clears throat> Doki Doki Panic. <laughs> Super Mario Bros. 2 is a lot like me. An awkward middle child. For decades, there's been a weird stigma surrounding this game, sandwiched between a game industry savior and an all-time masterpiece of a platformer. You may have heard people refer to it as the oddball, the weirdo, the black sheep. And while it's often regarded as a good game, I don't think people, or Nintendo themselves for that matter, put enough respect on its name. It is a weird game in the sense that it's not really underrated, but more just discredited or unrecognized. I've had this feeling for many years now. It was one of the older mainline Mario games I didn't get to experience in my early childhood days. And even during my younger years, I recognized and felt like this game was never referenced or showcased in the same light as the other Mario games of that era. I even remember asking my dad questions about it because I felt like it was never brought up in conversation within the Mario community. It's like a suspiciously distant family member. You know they're alive, but you don't know anything about them. Given the context of its development, it's understandable, but at the same time, it honestly baffles me. Here in the US, this is the official sequel to Super Mario Bros. The next installment to one of the most revolutionary video games ever created. That alone should give it some credit. Yes, it's different. Yes, it's recycled. But I still don't get why Super Mario Bros. 2 is so... I don't even know, mistreated? My goal is not to overhype this game, rather it's to recognize this game's significance to the Mario world, to Nintendo, and really just to give credit where credit is due, and to its credit, this game is genuinely a good game. <laughs> hey, hey look, I can, I can spin it. I cannot express to you the childhood mystery revolving around Super Mario Bros. 2. Seeing my old Mario game skip from 1 to 3, it just couldn't be. I may have been homeschooled, but with some simple math, I could spot a sequential mistake. See? The way my dad would describe it sounded so fascinating. I mean, playing as Toad? Throwing vegetables? What the heck is a triclide? It wasn't until one fateful Christmas morning when I received Mario's 25th anniversary re-release of Super Mario All-Stars on the Wii. This was it, my first exposure to Mario Bros. 2. I had no knowledge, no bias, just a kid finally uncovering the mystery that was the awkward Mario middle child. It's not your typical Mario experience as you're not stomping on Goombas or saving a princess. In fact, there's no such thing as stomping or Goombas and you are the princess. Platforming is still the name of the game. However, Mario's formula is kind of flipped on its head as everything isn't revolved around your feet, but rather your hands. Mario and friends finally decide to get their hands dirty as you pick up plants as projectiles, pick up enemies instead of stomping them, pick up keys to unlock doors. This simple change in design provides lots of different scenarios to work with, including levels where you find yourselves digging through sand pits. Other times we have these mini escort missions with these cursed keys and evil flying things chasing you around. Even the act of killing enemies always felt a little more substantial because your options slightly varied or were even limited in certain situations. And I don't know, pulling up these big boy plants and chucking them at enemies' faces compared to just bopping them on the head just felt right. The concept is far from anything crazy. It's quite the opposite. It's simple. I really enjoy it, but there's got to be more to it. Like, I can't put my finger on it. Oh, well, never mind. I just did. The moment you press the start button, you're greeted to my favorite feature this game offers. Four distinct playable characters, each with varying levels of strength, speed, and even some special abilities. Very few games explored this concept on the NES, and the way they handled it here was, in my opinion, pretty genius. If I had to describe each one, uh, Mario is the all-around average Joe, Luigi is awkwardly athletic, Toad feels like he's buzzed on pre-workout, and Peach is slow and can float because she's a delicate princess. I don't freaking know. You're never forced to play as any of these characters, but some levels obviously favor some play styles over others. This adds quite a bit of replay value in many aspects. The game is designed with every character in mind, and you have the freedom to choose how you want to approach each obstacle. If the platforming is too hard, you can choose Peach or Luigi. If the level involves a ton of digging, you can choose Mario or Toad. Some levels are outright broken using certain characters, and 1-2 is a 
perfect example of this. Luigi has such a high jump, you can literally skip the entire level by jumping off this ninja, and I love the fact that this game allows something like that. These characters not only enhance replayability, but they also encourage experimentation. Mario Bros. 2's foundation in its gameplay was already solid, but with the addition of multiple playable characters, it creates a memorable, fun experience to come back to that I feel is still underappreciated. These characters were distinct in their playstyles, but also distinct in their appearance. Mario Bros. 2 was very influential in creating the iconic characteristics and traits that these classic characters are known for today. Thankfully, not everything was set in stone after the original release because, uh, <laughs> what even is this? I'll tell to you. I'll tell you what it is. This is an abomination. The Mario universe in the 80s was still in its very early stages. I mean, Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Peach were the playable characters selected simply because those were the only characters they could select. But because of this decision and the way they brought these characters to light, the Mario universe truly began to blossom and solidify its identity. Not so much in its world, but mainly in these prominent protagonists. First was Mario, who is well known, but not well established visually. Most of his designs before this were uh, <laughs> they were mainly just inconsistent, but you gotta give them some grace here. They were still just figuring things out. Japan was a lot quicker in establishing Mario's identity, at least from an artwork point of view. But here in the US, it wasn't until Mario Bros. 2's debut where we would start to see his iconic attributes and style take form, both on the front cover, but also accurately depicted in-game as well. You got the shorter, slightly pudgier physique with the iconic red and blue color scheme. And even though the next installments slightly shifted his looks, this was ultimately the foundational pieces of Mario's modern day appearance. Luigi benefited most from his new design. Ever since the beginning, this guy has always been cast in the shadows, limited to being a palette swap with his brother on all fronts. But here, not only does he get a little taste of stardom, but we also get to see Luigi uniquely expressed in his appearance and physical attributes. He's sort of clumsy slash slippery, but can also jump extremely high with his goofy looking flutter kick. He's also taller, a little slimmer and pointier compared to his brother. And I know his personality didn't get fleshed out until Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube, but this was a pinnacle game that truly defined Luigi as a separate character. A character who acts differently, looks differently, is more awkward in some ways. I also know Lost Levels may have technically made some of these changes first, but to me, this will always be the game that gave Luigi the proper opportunity to step out and be different. Now, Toad and Peach may have not been as influential visually, uh, one of them makes that pretty obvious, but being in this position more so just solidified themselves as key characters in the Mario world. I think it's extremely cool to see Toad going from a little NPC pipsqueak in a castle to being a full-fledged playable character in a grander adventure. What's even more impressive is seeing Princess Peach going from a damsel in distress to joining the crew and embracing a more substantial part. There's no question that this game played a major role in forming identity for these beloved characters. Some of them were properly updated over time, others were changed back to simple palette swaps again, but ultimately these were the traits and characteristics they settled on years down the line. And because of this game, it planted a seed and blossomed these characters into who they are today. Mario Bros. 2's influence didn't just stop with the playable characters, but multiple mainstay enemies within the Mario world as well. Creatures like the Shy Guys, Pokies, Birdo, and bob -Oms all had their first debut. Super Mario Bros. 2 walked so that King bob -Omb could run. Let that sink in for a moment. Here's something that doesn't get talked about. Super Mario Bros. 2 is trustworthy. Like, it would catch a grenade for you, throw its hand on a blade for you, jump in front of a train for you, it would do anything for you. What am I trying to say? Well, this game, in a sense, saved the Mario franchise. You see, Japan had its own Mario Bros. sequel, known in America as The Lost Levels. This next installment was a slightly enhanced version of the original with the same exact gameplay with more complex designs in its levels and mechanics. It was a sequel alright, however, it's more of a continuation of the previous game on all fronts, including its difficulty curve. 
This ultimately led to the game being extremely unforgiving and painfully difficult. If I had to sum up the game's experience, I would say I wish these levels were never found because honestly they were probably lost for a reason. When presented to Nintendo of America, the decision was made to not release it to the American market because of the negative reception it could have potentially received. You also gotta remember, the game industry was still in its recovery stage from the crash of 1983, so paranoia was still lurking in the industry. To release something that's too difficult to the average consumer is one thing, but to release it attached to Nintendo's biggest and increasingly popular mascot could be detrimental to its reputation. Which brings us to this. Now for some, it may be hard to give this game the title of Mario's Savior, which is understandable. If Lost Levels was released to the American audience with negative reception, could Mario have rebounded? I think so. I will say it probably would have been a little more of an upward battle after that, but if they stayed the course to Mario Bros. 3, I think it would have been fine. But then that brings up another question. Would Mario Bros. 3 even exist? The fact of the matter is, the US Super Mario Bros. 2 added fuel to the fire to Mario's momentum, gaining positive reception across the board and selling over 10 million copies worldwide. It solidified mainstay Mario characters and gave Western audiences and the Mario franchise as a whole a substantially better and influential sequel. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, liking, Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You're probably thinking, dude, you're just gonna breeze past the fact that Super Mario Bros. technically has two sequels? How is that even possible? How did they even manage to make two games within such a short time period? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Did you know that Super Mario Bros. 2 is a reskin of Doki Doki P Okay, let's address this. There's, uh, <laughs> there's been one small detail I forgot to mention. Uh, <laughs> Super Mario Bros. 2 in the US is technically a recycled game. To better understand this, let me formally introduce you to Doki Doki Panic, released in 1987 exclusively on the Famicom Disk System in Japan. So you know how the original Mario Bros. 2 was rejected in America? Well, Nintendo's programmers were uh, pretty booked at that time, and with no Western Mario sequel in sight, they resorted to rework Mario assets into an already pre-existing game, their choice being Doki Doki Panic, for multiple reasons. It actually started out as a Mario-like prototype, but eventually got scrapped for the time being. The game's roots resembled Mario so heavily that the transition between assets were pretty seamless. So after implementing the Mario characters, polishing up some basic mechanics, difficulty, and graphics, the US Super Mario Bros. 2 hit store shelves in 1988, a year after Doki Doki Panic's release. And because of this interesting history is where we meet a Mario dilemma. You have some fans who swear by the title of this being an official Mario sequel with Mario-like themes and Mario mechanics, where other fans don't even consider it a Mario title due to its black sheep nature and technically having recycled content. And what makes this even worse is Nintendo themselves, I feel, has felt this tension over the years on which side they stand on, which is why I think this dilemma is the root of why this game often lacks respect to the public eye. I feel as though Mario Bros. 2 is put in a tough spot because it's mostly perceived as the game that took a time crunch bullet for Mario's reputation. But like I've already mentioned, not only should it get more credit for being a franchise shield, but it's also so much more influential than just that. The thing that obviously gives it a bad rap, though, is its reskinned assets, which is a valid criticism. However, most people don't know the full context of the situation and are so fixated on the fact that it's reskinned and less on the fact that it fully revived a commercial failure Famicom gem. There's really no concrete answer to this, but I believe Doki Doki Panic sold 200,000 copies. According to this website, I couldn't find this info anywhere else. I, I don't know, it, 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 didn't, it didn't sell great. It makes sense though, because you see, Doki Doki Panic was surely a publicity stunt. Yeah, 
a marketing strategy for a Japanese summer festival under the name Dream Factory. Nintendo was approached with making a game themed around the event, with the only requirement having the game revolve around these four characters. Talk about a lack of direction. They then assembled an all-star team with the Mario-like prototype being the base of the project. The all-star roster consisted of Kensuke Tanabe as the director, who would go on to help design in future Mario projects, Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario himself, as the general supervisor, and Koji Kondo, a Nintendo music legend as the composer. If that doesn't scream Mario, I don't know what does. And just to add a little cherry on top, as if it wasn't already Mario rooted enough, since it was a collaboration for both the Dream Factory event and Nintendo, Mario-themed properties were sprinkled in the original Doki Doki Panic to begin with. So the way I see it is Nintendo formed a quality team, put all these resources and time and effort into a genuinely good platformer just for it to flop on its face. So in my opinion, it deserved a second chance. And it just so happened that the stars aligned in favor of Nintendo re-releasing this game under a mascot who would guarantee more eyes, but also fully embrace its Mario roots. So in conclusion, given the whole context of the situation, I really don't think this game deserves as much hate as it gets for being a reskin of a game that was heavily inspired by Mario and designed by Mario-minded people. In fact, it was a smart and outright valid decision. Yeah, I said it. Reskinning was a good option. Am I right? <laughs> As if it wasn't obvious enough, I'm 100% an advocate for treating this as a genuine Mario sequel. In my eyes, it has the right ingredients, the right gameplay, the right developers, and honestly, a fair story to warrant that this is, in fact, a Mario game. But it's kinda hard to defend this claim when the original creators of the game don't firmly treat it as such. If I had to describe Nintendo's relationship with Mario Bros. 2, it would be lackluster. It's just kind of back and forth. It's not like they've done a terrible job referencing or representing this game. I just think it deserves more from them. I don't know, the vibes I get sometimes is it almost feels like they're embarrassed about this game. Almost like they regret making the reskinned Doki Doki Panic decision way back when. But my thought is, the damage has been done. Like, Mario Bros. 2's influence to the franchise has completely outweighed the Doki Doki Panic debacle in my eyes. It's too engrossed in the franchise for it to not be solidified or canon to the Mario series. So why do I feel like it still lacks the respect it deserves. Most of the time, the references we do get are either very subtle, placed in spin-offs, or feel like afterthoughts. The only authentic shout-out I feel this game has had is with Super Mario 3D World. Seeing four-player co-op with Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad having their original Super Mario Bros. 2 attributes was so sick. I remember, even as a kid, seeing Mario Bros. 2 get some proper representation like this genuinely made me so happy. But at the same time, you get a game like Mario Maker, one of the biggest callbacks to Mario's legacy, and yet we get little to nothing involving Mario Bros. 2. Now, I completely understand that Mario Bros. 2's engine didn't fit the seamless Mario Maker formula, but I still think it deserved some sort of representation. Thankfully, Mario Maker 2 did end up up finding a smart way to implement Mario Bros. 2 representation, but again, this was pretty limited and added later on as a content update, which felt kind of like an afterthought. A more recent example of a wasted opportunity for representation is with Super Mario Wonder. This game is phenomenal. I really don't have many complaints with it, and all I'm really saying here is this could have been a perfect time to add something weird and different from Mario Bros. 2 in a weird and different game like Mario Wonder. I mean, the whole Wonder Effect thing would have made for a cool gameplay shift into Mario Bros. 2's engine with the whole picking and throwing things. I will say they did rep Mario 2 a little bit here and there. I'm assuming these two badges are referencing both the super crouch jump as well as Luigi's high jump flutter kick, but again, I'm just assuming that's the case. 
enemy representation for Mario 2 has never been a huge problem. I know a few enemies have made their way into mainstay status within the Mario universe. However, I still think there's plenty more to pull from. My guys Flurry, Pidgeot, Fanto, Hoopster, Albatoss. Oh, and by far the biggest wasted potential in my opinion is the lack of repping the Mario Bros. 2 villains. Like, come on, you're really gonna leave these guys on the front porch while the Koopalings are partying in the back? I absolutely love these characters. Mouser, Fry Guy, Triclide, Claw Grip, and last, but certainly not least, Wart. Can we talk about this dude for a second? Like, why has Zelda given this man more representation? Like, if there was a Mario character that I would die for a reappearance, it would hands down be Wart from Subcon. I think he's so cool. His design, his dreamlike powers, his expressiveness. I demand this dude be brought back for something. Heck, I don't even care if he's an assist trophy in Smash. Seriously though, every single one of these guys 100% deserves a spot in like a Mario Kart roster. I think they would be amazing as throwback bosses in a future Mario title. I love these designs. I love how different they are. It just sucks they've been shafted so hard. As Especially my dude, Wart. Like out of all these guys, my man Wart deserves to live another day. Hashtag bring back Wart. <sighs> I have been waiting to properly get that off my chest for so long. I don't know, it's hard for people to regard this game with respect when the company who made it years ago doesn't fully do so. I mean, Nintendo, like I've said, this game isn't going anywhere, so instead of bashfully throwing bones here and there, just fully embrace it. But yeah, the likelihood of Nintendo actually doing this is like the premise of this whole game. It's just a dream. Super Mario Bros. 2 is a weird game, no doubt about it. It has a very interesting history, a lackluster relationship with its creator, but also an influential legacy that can't be ignored. And all of this combines into a public perception that leans more into mistreatment in my eyes. My hope is that my defense towards this game gives it less ridiculing pointer fingers and more respectable thumbs up, because as if I haven't stated it enough, I really do think this game deserves way more love and respect from both the general audience, but also its very own creators. It's a game I have a weird attachment to, and I'm not even really sure why. It's a great platformer, and just like a middle child, it's flown under the radar because it did its job so well. I can say that because I am one. Super Mario Bros. 2 is a Mario game. I'm sorry, it is, but it's the, you've heard my whole spiel by now. This really just gave me an excuse to shout out my boy Wart again. Seriously though, you should really get this hashtag trending because this man deserves it. <laughs> But let me know what you think about this whole Mario 2 topic down below in the comments. And if you made it this far, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, uh, liking, subscribing, commenting, you know the whole drill is a great way to do so. But again, I just wanted to say thanks, and I will hopefully see you guys here soon. <laughs>